stars run out of fuel. It's an immutable fact of the universe. They are born with what they have, and eventually that runs out like a gas tank. You cannot refill your tank with water. You need the specific materials for the engine, and stars run out too. Someday our sun will burn itself out and meet a slow death. A stellar death, however it may come, is a stellar death. This is something that all civilizations with basic advanced science and an understanding of the physical universe will know. They will know from the onset of their own understanding of astronomy and astrophysics that their star's time is limited. We appeared on this world towards the end of our sun's period of stability and indeed habitability. We inherited a very imperfect set of circumstances. This is not a perfect star system, and our sun is ever increasing in brightness. This is a fact of stellar physics, and over the next billion years or so, the sun will begin to bake the earth, and force the end of the age of life upon it. The surface of the earth will go molten. There are things that can be done to mitigate the fury of the sun, and there are bright spots in the darkness. Mining the outer layers of a red giant star for raw materials is better than mining any planet or asteroid, as an example. But the end is ultimately inevitable, because no matter what you do in this universe, a star like the sun, or any star, will become a remnant of a star, be it a cooling white dwarf, a neutron star, or a black hole, or a cooling blue dwarf, in the case of tiny stars. But all stars die. As a result, in order to survive the trillions of years left of the future of the universe as far as habitability is concerned, one is likely going to have to resort to space travel or the choice of extinction. Not space travel for exploring and colonizing the universe, but space travel just to continue to get by. Traveling space is a matter of anthropocentrism and how you look at it. We live on the order of eight decades or so. Therefore, we aren't so willing to spend 10,000 years in a generational spacecraft. Well, what happens if you live 10 million years? 10,000 years in that context is a breath. And the expanse of a single galaxy, or even travel to other nearby galaxies at sublight comfortable speeds, is within your grasp. To think like an alien, or a computer, requires one not to think like a human, and our time frames. But beyond that, you could colonize all stars possible for you to do so, and still find in the very far future that there's just nothing left of this universe that can be used to subsist. It will truly be the end of time, a period of the death of the black holes through evaporation, and effectively useless iron stars and cold cinders. It will be a time for anyone left by then to turn out the lights, close the door, and head into oblivion. But that is a long time away, trillions of years, and the universe still has the vast majority of its own life ahead of it. And yet there already are dying stars, and indeed, that process of death for the very first stars of the universe has already largely played out. The earliest stars of the universe did not harbor life because they only had the elements forged in the Big Bang to work with, hydrogen, helium, and precious little else. It took giant stars of hydrogen and helium to fuse and explode rapidly to populate the universe with the elements needed for rocky planets, water, and life. But a few billion years after the Big Bang, planets and life started becoming possible in the sense that we understand such things, and as a result of that, we are not the first possible technological civilization, not by far. We are very likely early in the game, the universe is young, but our own planet's 4.6 billion year history that led to us is only a somewhat large fraction of what seems possible, something like half the time planets have had, but that leaves a lot of room for earlier civilizations. It is entirely plausible that there could be civilizations out there that originated on planets twice the age of our own, and thus could be millions or billions of years more technologically advanced than we are. It's also possible that we were slow to develop and that most exoplanets with civilizations do it much more rapidly than Earth did. But how to travel to other stars is the question. It's possible. There are actually many ways, from generational ships to high relativistic speeds. But one odd reality of the universe is that if you're around a star, that star is moving through space on its own. And over the course of a star's lifetime in a galaxy dense with stars, it will routinely in geologic time encounter other stars closely. 
offering opportunities for colonization of other star systems for technological civilizations, without having to cross vast distances of space. There have been many, untold many, encounters between the Sun and other stars that passed within a light year or so, sometimes closer, offering accessibility to other star systems that wouldn't require traversing many hundreds of light years across the harshness of space and time. Close stellar encounters offer an alternative to jumping into starships for very long-term journeys, but there is yet another way. Alter the motion of your star while you have time, and send your entire star system to be in reasonable proximity to a star system of choice for colonization, long enough for you to take over a younger, more vibrant star system to ensure your longevity. There are many options for this. One very basic one is the Red Dwarfs. So we did not evolve under a Red Dwarf star. We got stuck with a quiescent but relatively short-lived Type G sun. It lived long enough for us to arise, but not that much longer meaning that at some point we will need to make plans to go elsewhere, somehow, if we are to continue. We may not make it that far, granted, but say we do. Or perhaps more importantly, say someone else has, and have created the means to move their aging star around the Milky Way to find better prospects. This is possible, and someone may be doing it, and we may be able to detect it if they have. Indeed, there are now candidates for this. More on that in a bit. This is the idea of the stellar engine, directing the power of a star with a giant sail of sorts or other means in order to use its emitted radiation to propel and steer it somewhere else. At its most basic, the idea is known as a Shkadov thruster. I've mentioned the concept in videos before, but here in more detail. The idea is termed a Class A stellar engine, and it's named after Dr. Leonid Shkadov, who first proposed it in 1987. The idea is this you create an enormous statite, a mirror, half a Dyson sphere or light sail near your star to reflect its radiation, and yet also balance its gravitational attraction towards its star. It cannot orbit. It has to sit stationary in the direction of the star's motion. The radiation pressure from that would be asymmetrical, meaning that the radiation would be stronger in one direction than the other, pushing the star through a net thrust towards its sail. Voila! The star and its planets move in whatever direction you want the whole system to. This would not be a huge effect. The thrust would be very weak given the size of the objects involved, but would also be eminently stable indefinitely with relatively minimal maintenance. Once you build it, as long as you keep your eye on it, your entire star system becomes a spacecraft that can be steered, but only to a degree because if the exhaust from it hits your planets, then they roast. So the thrust has limited direction it can be pointed. It would just take a long time, millions of years to get up to any real speed in this. But if you have the time, you have the means. Class A is often depicted as half a Dyson sphere, but it does not have to be that configuration. There are more realistic ways of doing it. Class B is a bit different in that it is two concentric spheres around a star, here the inner sphere gets hotter while the outer sphere and the difference in temperature produces the ability to do work. But this is not necessarily propulsive, but it is a stellar engine for producing energy. A Class C stellar engine effectively is just a combination of type A and B in that it can accelerate a star but also produce energy. There are several designs for this, but there are issues of stability involved with some of these that would need to be addressed. Other ideas over the years include the relatively recent Kaplan Thruster, which uses the concentrated collected energy of the star to excite a focused outer region, or regions of a star to create excited solar wind, which can be collected by a ramjet, resulting in directed plasma, which pushes the star along. Another would be the Savoranos Star Tug, which is a hybrid of sorts between a Shkadov Thruster and a Kaplan engine which increases the efficiency and the power of the thrust. But now there is another option, released recently. In a paper by Clement Vidal, link in the description below, he details an overlooked fact. Most of the ideas thus far for stellar engines focus on single stars. However, about half of all stars in the Milky Way are in fact binary and multiple star systems. And those systems could easily host advanced civilizations, essentially as well as a single star system like our own can. 
Having two stars changes the dynamics of stellar engines, however, and the paper suggests a very specific circumstance for this kind of an engine. It is envisioned as an engine for a subclass of binary millisecond pulsars, known as spider pulsars, but also stellivores because they are essentially destroying their companions, though not necessarily through eating them as in a normal accreting pulsar, but blowing them away and producing thrust. This is counterintuitive. Usually when we think of pulsars with star companions, it's accreting material, sucking it from the companion star. Not here, at its most basic. This is where the pulsar is bombarding its companion star so energetically that the companion star's outer layers are being stripped off. This is not normally a star system that would seem of much use, and we do not look at such stars in SETI actively yet. But here, it actually is an advantage, a big one. Interestingly, Vidal's concept is fully steerable. There are a number of effects that can be employed that allow for far greater manipulation of the motion of the star system in question. And there are two types of spider stars, black widows and redbacks, who offer different properties magnetically. The only real rule here is that the system must generally be newly formed, or the companion star would have been evaporated away, which raises questions on how long planets in a system like this could have had to form life, and how that life formed in the bombarding environment of a pulsar. But let's say that this method was not an alien civilization's first star, and that they colonized it. Then the equation changes. This idea sounds like science fiction. It is within the realm of physics, and it's still a new idea with a lot more study needed to work out the details. But it does differ from many conceptual ideas in that it would produce a technosignature that we could detect. And in fact, as it turns out, there are candidates for this from the start. The thing here is that hidden deeply in astronomy are questions about pulsar behavior that do not have ready answers. There are strange things that are observed that remain unresolved. One such Black Widow pulsar system is J1641 plus 8049. This pulsar seems to have changed behavior over two different observations separated by several years. This may be in part or wholly due to observational flaws. But as it stands, the system appears to have slowed down. This concept actually allows for the deceleration of the system. You can point the thrust in the opposite direction of travel and employ techniques to direct the thrust on the companion star itself to do this. This would get spooky if this deceleration is real and a target star can be identified. Because if the deceleration is set up to match the target star for capture, and perhaps capture and use it to continue the spider drive with a fresh new star, then that would be a strong technosignature indeed. You can't board the bus when it's traveling on a road, but if you catch up to it and match its speed and jump over, you can. And evidence was found for other pulsars passing nearby other stars, though all objects and star systems generally do this. Oddly, one candidate for that actually is PSR J1959 plus 48 which also shows an anomalous alignment of the system with the motion of the star system through space, which raises eyebrows, because it's not expected for it to likely be that way, yet it is. It is, however, expected with an alien spider stellar engine. And it has to be noted, if you are moving a pulsar just to position it somewhere as part of a pulsar positioning system, these kinds of systems actually are ideal for that. The paper identifies the redback pulsar 4FGL J1702.7-6566 as showing a modulation that could be interpreted as a very gradual steering process in the orbital plane of the system, changing it through asymmetric heating, one of the techniques involved in the concept. Also, oddly, redback pulsars have been noted to be able to switch between accretion phases and evaporation phases, which may be linked to this. Yet another is very weird. The pulsar PSR J1311-3430 is generating thrust in bursts in such a way as to do it in three equal sections of its orbital plane. And there are yet more candidates. The bottom line with all of this is that it's very new material, and while there are candidates, they are not yet well constrained as far as their properties, and there could still be measurement problems. We've only known about this type of pulsar since 1988, 
with the discovery of the Black Widow Pulsar PSR B1957-20, and only more observation will start to pin down the weird circumstances of this class of Pulsar, but it does enter the arena of potential technosignatures that up until recent years would not have been envisioned. One thing is clear, if this does turn out to be the case, then we just found, at least, Kardashev Type 2. Thanks for listening, I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently musing. This sort of a stellar engine was not envisioned until very recently. No one thought to look for such a thing, which shows you just how little we know about SETI. You have to think of what to look for first before you look for it, and no one quite thought like this until now. The real search here has not yet even begun. Food for thought. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.